Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, we'll be speaking on the topic of how do we build long-term infrastructure when funding is uncertain here at the Digital Preservation 2021 conference. We have three panelists and I will be your moderator. I am Amy Rudersdorf, a senior consultant with AVP. The panelists you'll be hearing from today include Ilda Teresa Ayala Gonzalez. She'll be speaking first. She's the director uh, at the General Archives of Puerto Rico Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. Following Ilda is Margot Padilla, the digital archivist at the New York Historical Society. And speaking third is Emily Fotenhauer, the digital strategist and grants manager at Wills, a statewide library organization. After the panelists speak, there will be a Q&A period, but don't feel like you have to wait to answer your questions or ask your questions at that point. Feel free to drop questions in the chat throughout the session and the panelists and I are here to answer them. So without further ado, I will hand off the, um, the microphone to Ilda, who is going to start us out. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, and hi, everyone. I'm very excited to share with you all our first digital preservation initiative and how we are managing to accomplish our goals of building long-term infrastructure with limited resources. The General Archives of Puerto Rico is part of the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, the State Arts Agency of Puerto Rico. Its mission is to receive, safeguard, preserve, and disseminate the cultural heritage documents of Puerto Rico. It was established by the law number five of December 8 in 1955, known as the Law for Records Administrations in Puerto Rico. We are the largest repository on the island, preserving over 90,000 cubic feet of documents from government agencies, public corporations, municipalities, and private collections, dating from 1730 until now. Its records include texts, newsprint, maps, photographs, books, audio, and video collections. Our institution has seen major budget cuts. Unfortunately, more than 90%. And we have been able to achieve special projects through a mix of special assignments and external funding. In 2020, thanks to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, we began planning our first digital preservation initiative linked to our current mass digitization project that hopes to make available over 500,000 images of our most valuable records by 2023. We are using this project as our backbone to build our digital preservation infrastructure to maximize the use of our resources. When we wrote the Mellon Grant, digital preservation needed to be an essential part of it. And we are approaching as a small pilot project that can help us build for the future, one step at a time. Because our limited budget, we couldn't create a digital preservation department. So we hire a consultant, which is ADP, to help us understand our strengths and limitations. One great thing about ADP was the opportunity to share this process and develop each product in Spanish. This made a great difference between lowering one of our biggest barriers we have, which is language. The report will also help us secure more funding as it highlights our goals and our needs. The assessment led into developing a roadmap that was clear, simple, with goals that we can accomplish in a very comfortable time frame. The layout is a checklist that will guide us to build a strong program in the future, I mean, in the next five years. We took into consideration all the resources we had. We focused on how could we best take advantage of what we are building through the Mellon Grant and insert diverse digital preservation strategies into it. One of the main goals of the assessment was to get advice for developing our policies. With the recommendation, we already established the long-term preservation formats, the metadata to be captured and embedded, the digital objects workflow and the backup strategy using external drives until we can get our server. And we currently share responsibilities between the programmer, the project manager and myself. 
because the funding is limited, we needed to take the long road for digital preservation, working with one thing at a time and selecting strategies that involve minimal economical investments, but that are smart on the long term. One example is that we currently have no server to store our digital objects that are being created. We have multiple external drives. Our plan was to acquire a one petabyte capacity server. Although there are models on the market that can reach these numbers, they would require a do-it-yourself approach. Because we don't have an in-house IT personnel, instead we are looking into a server with initial storage capacity of at least 300 terabytes of usable space. That means from now, and it's enough for our project. With storage growth capacity, I mean scalability, to at least one petabyte. And this will require minimal IT support for at least three years. This way, our investment will only require the acquisition of additional disk, but all the other infrastructure would be enough to scale up for the next three years. On the other hand, we can implement a digital preservation software or even a collection management software that will require monthly payments or yearly subscription. Instead, we are developing simpler solutions by using open source software and so forth. We are evaluating every need and coming up with solutions that are tailored to what we can actually do. So how are we doing it? We don't have a digital archivist or a digital preservation specialist. At the archive, I am the, per the only person who has a little background and understanding around digital preservation. So a lot of the planning and decision making is my responsibility. And I am conscious that we need to include in our planning if we want to do things right. As I mentioned, we currently have a digitization project and we are taking this opportunity to implement our digital preservation strategies into the digitization workflow. Although we don't call it a preservation department, everyone is involved and have a responsibility that will help us accomplish our goals. For example, the project manager establishes the unique naming conventions to make sure all is standardized. The photographers are aware of the administrative, technical, and preservation metadata they need to capture and embed it to the digital files. The QCs process the raw files into TIFF which is our preservation master, and organize the file structure with master file, production file, access files, and documentation. These will later be used to create our preservation bags for long-term storage. The metadata team makes sure to capture descriptive content and ensures correspondence between the physical and the digital objects. Later, the programmer revises the content and it will be the person responsible to implement fixity checks and creating the bags to deposit the content in the long-term storage. For now, we have two external drives and this is where we are keeping our backups. Also, the QCs maintain a backup of each of their work. This is definitely not perfect. It's definitely three, three, two, one. It's not three, two, one, but we're building little by little. By using the digitization initiative, we have been able to maximize the resources and develop the basics for our digital preservation program. So far, we have been able to define workflows, team roles, metadata content standards, schemas, preservation formats, initial storage capacity, initial storage strategy, process documentations, and the software we're going to be using, which will be Fixity and Bagen. This year, which ends in June 2022, we still have work to do. First, we have to formalize the digital preservation policies. They are more instructions right now than a policy. We have to evaluate if the processes, workflow, and software that was selected will still work as we increase the amount of data. We also have to work with the estimate growth and storage capacity for the next, next phase and, um, and the growth to one petabyte. And the implementation of the server and the new backup system we will be adding an LTO as another backup solution. This will be used to keep our copy outside of premises in a vault. We know this project will provide us with enough documentation to build a case for future growth. Our strategy will seek to engage the administrator into securing funding and increase our production and enhance user services. 
Where do we see our project in the next five years? Well, the digitization and the digital preservation workflow will continue to be dependable. I believe that shared responsibilities are working great. We would like to have an in-house digital preservation specialist. I can be all, and I am definitely not a specialist. I have learned a lot through great professional development opportunities. We also want to evaluate the availability of a preservation software to use. We want to see if cloud storage is a good alternative as a backup solution. This is important due to our vulnerabilities to natural disasters. And although the LPO will be outside our premises, it would be best if at least one copy is outside of the island. And we also want to increase our storage capacity by year. Uh, by year three, we hope to get that petabyte. And by year five, we need to grow to at least three. And I think the most important thing is that we have to continue to share resources. It is untruth to believe that the government will pay it all, even you know, if we think it should. So we have to continue to use a mix between seeking external funding and recurring funding, and it's actually working pretty well. It's important to define which will be financed by what. For example, maintaining and increasing storage capacity and paying for the basics of the team should be recurring funding. But enhancing or expanding the initiative, like hiring three instead of two persons, could be work for external funding. Thank you for everything. Hi, my name is Margot Padilla, and I'm the digital archivist at the New York Historical Society. I was hired in 2019 as part of a five-year Leon Levy Foundation grant to develop the infrastructure for collecting, processing, preserving, and making accessible born digital materials. Over the grant period, I'm building out a born digital program using grant funds, but we'll need to phase that into the regular operational budget, being mindful that there is no dedicated digital preservation budget after the end of the grant period. So I'm aiming for incremental growth and flexibility, and I'm applying best practices for digital stewardship in a way that is adaptable in the face of uncertain funding while remaining stable and trustworthy. The New York Historical Society is experienced with digital collections. Both the New York Historical Society Museum and Library have a digitization program in place with robust digitized collections featuring paintings, photographs, manuscripts, maps, and other materials. The library presents its digital collection using Islandora and the museum uses eMuseum. Those systems and workflows are already integrated with permanent operations in terms of staff time and ongoing maintenance. My focus is on born digital materials, specifically materials coming to us from donors, from the institution for our own institutional archives, and on legacy media currently held in the collection. The cost of establishing and managing the infrastructure for born digital stewardship is entirely grant funded. That includes one dedicated full-time staff member, which is me, all of the equipment and software and other odds and ends. Over the course of the grant period, I will train three permanent staff in digital archiving and transition the work over to them gradually as they gain skills and experience and begin to close that knowledge gap. So my main focus is on integrating up op into operational costs where I can, aligning resources where I can, making sustainable decisions when it comes to hardware and software purchases, and to avoid a set and forget main mentality. So consistently making clear that digital stewardship is not a one-time cost and that it requires active and continuous work with sufficient staffing and technology support. To date, our biggest expense has been for storage. I worked with IT to purchase a dedicated storage appliance for the library's born digital and digitized collections. That is backed up nightly and backed up offsite to tape every few weeks. And we also have everything backed up to the cloud. Being mindful not only of the financial implications of excessive long-term storage, but also the environmental toll, we've developed a tiered approach where resources are allocated according to the value and uniqueness of the materials being preserved. For example, digitized items with available analog versions will receive limited redundant replication, whereas unique born digital materials will receive geographically distributed and redundant replication. So we used grant funds here to make the big initial purchase of reliable on-site storage with plenty of space for us to grow into, as well as expanding our cloud storage. 
And frankly, altogether, that had a price tag that may not have been approved as part of regular expenditures. In the long term, though, now that it has been purchased and it is on site, the cost of maintenance and, um, and support of the storage appliance will be managed by the IT department and will become part of the permanent budget. So we have our storage, which is a critical element of digital preservation. Another is controlling what can come in the door. I wrote a digital preservation policy and decision flow chart that set some guidelines for how we would acquire and preserve foreign digital materials. For example, the policy establishes our levels of commitment, our approach to copyrighted or commercially available content, what we might discard, approaches to preservation, and so on. It's not practical or responsible for us to take in everything that we're offered. So the policy works to help curators determine what can be responsibly brought into the collection. The policy also defines how digital stewardship responsibilities are distributed amongst curators, processing archivists, public service staff, and IT. And this is part of embedding digital stewardship within existing functions and permanent staff responsibilities from the outset. Along those lines, I also made this flow chart and sent it to all library department heads to illustrate the overall processes, how those tasks are divided and assigned, and the documentation they can refer to when performing those tasks. In addition to making clear how responsibilities are distributed, this is also part of the process of creating awareness about the ongoing work of digital stewardship and to demonstrate that dedicated staff time will be necessary. For technology, when selecting equipment and software for digital acquisitions and processing, I think it's tempting to splurge on so-called out-of-the-box solutions or high-ticket items like a forensic recovery of evidence device or FRED when you have grant money. But it's important to resist that urge and operate in a limited budget mindset and be very deliberate with spending. For example, instead of something like a FRED, I went with a Windows workstation some write blockers, and other equipment that I've listed out here. The total cost for our initial setup was around $2,000. We have our workstations, some external storage, floppy drives, and you'll also see some items here that we will likely purchase and some which may, we may determine won't ultimately serve our needs. IT upgraded an existing machine for use as a quarantine machine, and then we purchased one additional machine with grant funds for processing. The key to this setup is anything can be swapped out or added and we're not locked into a proprietary system. It enables us to scale up and down the road, if we need to request funds for additional equipment, those requests are made in targeted ways based on our growth and our discovery about what hardware is necessary for us. But importantly, nearly all of the equipment is familiar to our IT department. We are very lucky to have IT support, but it is limited because the IT department serves the entire institution, not just the library. So we can't overburden them with specialized requests. With this setup, we are better aligned with their services. So down the road, if permanent library staff are unable to troubleshoot something happening with the equipment, our in-house IT can diagnose the issue relatively easily where that might not be the case if there was a problem with more specialized piece of, pieces of equipment or if we were reliant on a vendor. I've also approached our tools and software with a limited budget mindset and have gone almost exclusively with open source and free tools that have a graphical user interface or GUI. Because I will be training permanent staff in digital archiving who have only a little technical experience, a GUI makes it a bit more friendly and easier to learn as opposed to something like the command line, which can be intimidating and would take a lot of additional training. Also, starting with free software or the free version of some software is a great way to get familiar with what your long-term needs are. And again, being able to make those targeted purchases in the future based on your experience. So you'll see here some of the tools that we are working with, including those we have purchased, such as QuickView and the professional version of TreeSize. Of course, using open source or free software is never actually free, which leads me to my final point, digital preservation is people. Right now, the biggest challenge we are facing is staffing. As I've mentioned, part of my responsibility is to train permanent staff to operate the systems I've put in place before my departure at the end of the grant period. 
I hope I've demonstrated in this talk that it is possible to get started and deploy effective modulated strategies for digital stewardship using grant funds and contingent labor. However, without long-term specialized management and an internal team dedicated to digital stewardship, growth will be limited and the wheels are gonna come off after a certain point. Digital preservation is not a technical problem to be solved, and it won't matter what you can or can't afford to purchase if there's nobody there to run it. Digital stewards constantly upskill and retain expertise in both current and past technologies, use their expert judgment to piece together solutions to meet unforeseen challenges, and do the unglamorous but absolutely necessary work of long-term digital stewardship. Your institution is not doing digital stewardship if you do not have full-time permanent staff dedicated to the work. So that's where I suggest nearly all of your planning and advocacy work goes if your intention is to steward collections from the late 20th and 21st centuries. Luckily, given that so many other factors that influence digital, the cost of digital stewardship are difficult to estimate, staffing is one of the more predictable expenses, making it a more definitive ask. In terms of using grant funds for staffing to get your digital stewardship efforts started or perhaps progress in a particular area, I suggest referring to Collective Equity, a handbook for designing and evaluating grant funded positions, which will help you to design your contingent positions and grant funded projects ethically. Once your grant funded work has begun and you want to start advocating for permanent positions, you can also refer to the Collective Responsibility Labor Advocacy Toolkit, which among other things has a set of scenarios and scripts for talking about contingent labor at work. The overall goals for our digital collections is that they are safely stored, discoverable and accessible and that our processes are sustainable over time. A grant funded project can be used to raise awareness within the institution about digital stewardship and the ongoing resources it, re it will require and get advocacy work going. Wherever there is reluctance to include a permanent budget line for ongoing technology and staff support, the important thing is to establish responsible collecting based on the available resources and to set reasonable expectations. In other words, stop doing more with less. Limit your capacity and find ways to create pressure against institutional plans and priorities that are not adequately and reliably funded. Thank you very much, and please feel free to contact me with any questions. Hello, my name is Emily Fotenhauer. I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin, and I've worked with WILLS, or Wisconsin Library Services, since 2009. WILLS is an independent 501c3 member organization that provides project management, consulting, and other services to libraries across the state. I manage various digital initiatives for WILLS, including the Recollection Wisconsin Statewide Digital Collections Consortium. Today, I'm going to share a bit about how Recollection Wisconsin supports small, rural, and tribal cultural heritage institutions as they develop sustainable and localized approaches to digital preservation. First, a bit of background on the Recollection Wisconsin program. This statewide consortium started in 2005 in order to provide centralized access to digitized cultural heritage collections from Wisconsin repositories. In 2016, Recollection Wisconsin joined the Digital Public Library of America as a service hub. And currently we provide access to more than 630,000 metadata records contributed by more than 200 libraries, archives, museums, and historical societies. Recollection Wisconsin also functions as a centralized resource for documentation and expertise to help those organizations digitize, describe, and share their collections online. WILLS provides the project management for the Recollection Wisconsin Consortium, which is led by six governing partners. Those partners are the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which maintains our metadata harvester, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, Milwaukee Public Library, Marquette University, the Wisconsin Historical Society, and the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, or DPI. Since 2005, Recollection Wisconsin has been funded essentially year to year with a patchwork of funding sources, including contributions of federal LSTA and state WiseLearn funds, both administered by DPI, grants from various private foundations in the state, in-kind contributions from our governing partners, and also several competitive federal grants for specific short-term projects. 
One of the big differences between my work and the programs that Ilda and Margot have described is that Recollection Wisconsin is not a repository. We don't hold any content, we only aggregate its metadata. From the beginning, our approach has been highly decentralized in order to account for individual partners, unique local infrastructure, resources, and needs. Prioritizing local control might sometimes feel like a bit of a roadblock, but it's incredibly important. Respecting local control has become especially significant as we've started to work more closely with tribal libraries, archives, and museums that aim to uphold indigenous data sovereignty. As defined by the United States Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, that is the inherent right of sovereign American Indian nations to govern the collection and ownership of their own data as they do their people, lands, and resources. Sorry, going too far ahead. So then of course, there's the challenge of limited resources. Often when we talk about small or under-resourced institutions that really encompasses a pretty huge range of access to staffing, infrastructure, and expertise. For my purposes, when I say small, I mean really, really small. For example, a rural public library with one professional staff member or a local historic house museum open seasonally and managed entirely by volunteers. Minimal funding and minimal staffing mean that staff at small organizations take on a huge range of responsibilities of which digital collections management is only a very small sliver if it's there at all. Moreover, frequent turnover at small and rural institutions can result in a lack of continuity in institutional knowledge, planning, and decision-making. Given this environment, Recollection Wisconsin has chosen to focus on education and advocacy around digital preservation as the most impactful strategies to equip small organizations to take on this work. To that end, we've aimed to raise the baseline understanding of basic digital preservation concepts, like digital preservation is an ongoing process and digitization is not preservation. We push some simple practical actions that are accessible to organizations of any size and require little if any infrastructure for example, things like developing a digital preservation policy, creating an inventory of digital collections, and identifying multiple locations to store copies of your files. In terms of advocacy, we try to put preservation in the context of real world needs and concerns. For example, the importance of digital preservation can really click with some organizations when they consider it in the context of protecting the investments they have already made in a digital initiative, whether that's public money, grants, private donations, or hours of volunteer time. So I want to briefly spotlight a concerted effort we undertook to support our goal of raising baseline understanding in the community. The Curating Community Digital Collections, or CCDC initiative, was supported by an IMLS Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian grant from 2017 to 2019. Recollection Wisconsin worked with our state's two MLIS programs, the iSchool at UW-Madison and the School of Information Studies at UW-Milwaukee to place graduate students in summer fieldwork positions in small and under-resourced memory institutions across the state. Each fieldwork placement was designed as a three-part collaboration consisting of a graduate student, a staff member from the host site, and a professional librarian or archivist from a larger partner institution who served as the mentor for the team. Our first cohort in summer of 2018 consisted of six teams, and our second cohort in 2019 included 10 teams. The CCDC initiative was inspired by and modeled in part on the cohort model of the National Digital Stewardship Residency Program, NDSR, as well as the Digital Power Institutes. And we designed this program with three main goals in mind. First, to provide relevant hands-on work experiences for Wisconsin Information School graduate students, Next, to help small institutions in Wisconsin develop policies and plans to better manage their existing digital assets. And finally, to build a community of practice around digital stewardship work within the state. Recollection Wisconsin currently has two other federal grants underway to support education and community building. Our strategy with these shorter term project-based funding opportunities is always to focus on how a short-term grant enables longer-term capacity building, both within our own organization and with our partners. What relationships can we build? What new resources can we create? 
What new information or expertise can we gain from a grant that will help us sustain or scale up our program or that will inform and strengthen our community partners? So two examples here, one is our digital readiness community of practice, which was launched with the support of planning and implementation grants from the NHPRC, working in partnership with the Wisconsin Historical Society. This initiative aims to lay a strong foundation for digital stewardship, specifically in local historical societies and historic preservation organizations. And we found that the best uptake and the strongest engagement in this topic tends to come when similarly sized or structured organizations learn from each other rather than listen to us instruct them. So we've prioritized, excuse me, we've prioritized opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning and information sharing, including case studies and virtual events that we've called digital readiness fairs. And some of our community of practice participants presented about this initiative earlier in today's conference, so I won't spend more time on it here, but check out the recording if you haven't seen that presentation. And then finally, uh, another initiative in, works, in the works is the Curating D Indigenous Digital Collections Project. This is supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, NEH, and it aims to extend and deepen the model that we used for the CCDC initiative by placing early career information professionals with tribal libraries, archives, and museums for year-long postgraduate fellowships. And with this work, we are borrowing from and benefiting from the leadership of Kim Christian and the Center for Digital Scholarship and Curation at Washington State University. Our first fellow in this program, Sarah Lundquist, began working with the Ho-Chunk Department of Cultural Preservation in May of 2021. She's working with staff in the Ho-Chunk Language Division and Museum Program to inventory digital collections, understand available technical capacities, and develop strategies to advocate for ongoing support for digital stewardship work with tribal, tribal government and other tribal departments. So to wrap up today, I'll just say thank you for your time. And please go ahead and use the chat to ask any questions you might have for me or the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much for those presentations, everyone. Uh, really a lot a lot of good information there. I think we're all learning a lot about this topic. Um, I'd like to dive in a little bit more uh, with some Q&A. We have about 10 minutes. And so I'm gonna ask some questions and attendees should feel free to drop questions into the chat as well. And we can ask uh, or we can answer those questions as the recording is going. So uh, let's get started. My first question is for Margo and Ilda. Um, I'm interested if you could tell us a little bit more about how you talk to your administrators about funding challenges um, and, and maybe a little bit about what the concerns or questions are that they have about what I call programmatic funding. So long-term funding or budgeted funding as opposed to one-time grant funding. Um, so uh, maybe Margot, do you wanna start? And then Ilda, you can uh, follow. Okay. Um, yeah, so the main focus of my work is to move off of grant funds into the permanent budget. So a lot of the questions that I get are um, more, more about things like annual subscriptions, um, anything that requires some sort of annual cost because the budget is not set. Um, so we don't want to come to rely on any of those things. Um, a, a lot of the questions that I also get from administration are technology focused, um, but I think um, there's a tendency to think that because technology changes so rapidly that somehow it's indicative of the impermanence of digital collections and maybe therefore digital collections are somehow less significant because of that unpredictability. But um, really I try to put it in terms of infrastructure that is understood as being permanent like shelving and temperature control. Um, and it's, it's funny how easily it works. They can just wrap their minds around how permanent and ongoing um, those costs are gonna be, however unpredictable they might be. Um, but of course, I always try to emphasize that the true cost is in staffing and having a dedicated team and that that's the true ongoing cost is, is personnel. Um, and that's, that's a harder conversation because that's a, uh, definitely a higher cost. Um, but that's the thing that I bring up almost any time I'm asked about, about costs, even if it's, you know, even if it's out of the blue. Um, you know, for example, we were talking a lot about web archiving and I was 
you know, it's about managing expectations as well. And I said, you know, without a dedicated budget to pay for an ongoing, you know, subscription to something like Archive It, and without a staff member to run it, even a percentage of their time, it's not worth doing. And so, you know, the answer is no. Um, so just, you know, to, to, I said this in my talk, but, you know, to stop doing more with less and to just say no, um, and to manage expectations that way and to be responsible in that way as well. That's a really good point. Um, and one I think people can be afraid to um, take, you know, the, the idea of saying no to things. That's a hard thing to do. Uh, uh, Ilda, do you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, I agree with um, what Margot was saying. It's, uh, it's very difficult, uh, but we do have to learn how to say no. In uh, my case, I think um, I like data and I like products. The way that um, I approach funding is if we have one technician and we're digitizing and, and we're able to digitally preserve certain amount of data and we're also reaching an amount of uh, users and we also increase the visits and we increase the donations, they can actually see that they're receiving something in exchange. So funding is um, understand as a, like a return of investment. And also with this data and the products that we produce, we can estimate an increase for the next year budget. So that way they can see the different changes. Like if we're planning on a budget for five years, every year the budget is gonna be very different. So, but if they see it in the long term and they see the return of investment of this money that they're putting forward, they kind of understand it and they go for it. And also I always find an opportunity to talk about the funding and the importance of maintaining or looking for, for funding for the projects. This way uh, they can see that um, there is a, a positive side of it. Um, I, for example, if we're having lunch or we're in a meeting, I try to find a, a good opportunity to let them know maybe about a project that you're running out or something that just came out of um, the, the production and talk about it and show it to them and explain how it works. And once they see that this um, has a product, they kind of uh, like it and follow your back end provide funding for additional stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point too. Uh, just keeping it front and center all the time. Does anybody have any response to Yilda or should I jump into the next question? Okay, so my next question is for Emily. Um, your, your situation's a little different because you're working with lots of smaller organizations. And so I'm wondering how, how we get smaller organizations to prioritize digital preservation, understanding their very limited funding. And when we're talking about sm smaller organizations, I mean, you've already defined that in your talk, um, but I think for a lot of listeners, these are organizations that are probably much smaller than their own. So um, I'll hand it to you and let you hear, or we'll hear what you have to say. Thanks. Um, yeah, exactly. These are really small um, institutions, a lot of rural public libraries and small um, local historical societies, a lot of organizations that are run pretty much entirely by volunteers. So what we focus on on a statewide level is really trying to um, kind of demystify the uh, work of digital preservation and emphasize some of the sort of simple and achievable actions. So things, um, so really um, on a statewide level, providing education and kind of um, guidelines to to what are the, the key sort of simple things that you can do to, um, to move your content forward into the future. Um, I always think of the, um, so Trevor Owens quote from the, um, his uh, theory and craft of digital preservation. And one of the axioms is something like um, highly technical definitions of digital preservation are complicit in silencing the past. So really those, those sort of technical, um, uh, obfuscation can can really kind of lead to a, a loss of all of this global history and community collections that are um, are being digitized. We know um, this content is out there, um, so trying to make it as um, 
as straightforward as possible for small organizations to move forward with limited resources. So we focus a lot on kind of raising the baseline vocabulary and kind of building a shared vocabulary. So some of the, the things that we've um, taught about are things like the, the three, two, one rule that we've, we've heard come back to us. We did some um, virtual um, kind of peer to peer information um, sessions over the summer and, and, and we heard organizations um, you know, an organization talked about how overwhelmed they felt, and then another organization, a county historical society, said, "Oh, well, they, they need to do the three, two, one rule. They just, you know, just just make another copy and put it somewhere else." And we were like, "Yes, that you know, we're that's that's the small small steps that we want to encourage." That's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I'm hearing here is. Um, I mean, it's clearly it's communication is a big piece, but what Ilda said and what you said too, it's kind of keeping that at the fore, um, really emphasizing over and over again, um, the need um, in order to keep it in people's consciousness. So they are thinking about it when they're thinking about these larger decisions around funding. Uh, does anyone have any other uh, thoughts before we um, wrap up? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. And again, if you have questions that you uh, want to ask the panel, feel free to drop them in the chat. We have just another minute or two and we are happy to answer them. Thank you very much. <laughs>